Hello, everybody. It's Friday night and it's time for the Weekender once again. Our look at some of the favorite stories that have caught our eye over the past seven days. Uh, join Ben as he makes an impact with his indie free as she gets into her investigations. John will talk about some armored vehicles and I'll get gutted to Galliard. On top of that, we have a prize of Wingspan from UK Games Expo and their partner Asmodee. If you want to be in with the chance to win the ornithological card and board game, then you need to be a subscriber to the channel. Pop a comment down below and if you can give us a like and share us around on social media, that would help us out an awful lot. Sit back and relax because your Easter starts now. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Weekender. I'm joined by Ben, Free, and John to take this meander through miniature game mayhem, because I do like my alliteration. <laughs> uh, as you may or may not be aware, today is Good Friday, which used to mean all the pubs and off-licenses were shut in Ireland, which was a terrible day, but thankfully they're open now. Yay! It also means it's Easter weekend. It so, is. In, amongst, in amongst putting your flat pack Ikea bunny rabbits together, <laughs> which is a thing uh, and boggles my mind completely. Uh, a few other of the gaming companies out there have also done little things for they the Easter. Uh, yes. So we thought we'd bring those to your attention before we throw Jeez. ourselves wholesale into the rest of the show. Mm. Um, so who have we got first then, Benjamino? Um, yeah, so all of these miniatures are going to be available for this Easter weekend. So if you want to get your hands on them, nice. make sure you do that. Or they may be even limited edition, so much so mm. that you'll you'll need to get in there quickly before they even go before the end of Sunday. But yes, we start off with Raging Heroes, who have released a couple of new miniatures alongside some bundles for you to dive into to play around with. Uh, building on their sort of sister heroine range, which could be used for sci-fi or fantasy, whatever you desire. We so have one can uh, make your own yeah, they can do. They are, they are deadly. That's why they have them on shields, because they're yeah. <laughs> um, So we have St. Uriel, the Angel of Easter. If you wanted to tell her, uh, looking pretty awesome. You can see that she's even got a little Easter egg of her own that mm. has hatched a weird bird, um, which I think is I pretty think that, awesome. I think that's a griffin. Looks like a griffin. A weird griffin. A weird <laughs> griffin, yeah. Well, technically, a griffin is a weird bird. Well, we <laughs> haven't seen, yeah, if you haven't seen one fresh from the egg, who knows? That's true, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but again, one of their big sort of over-the-top sculpts, which I think are really fantastic for pretty much any of those kind of fantasy games that you're playing mm. at the moment. Uh because of the style of it, it could be used in fantasy games, but could also fit into some sci-fi if you wanted as well. Could use it as your saint figure, perhaps, mm. in your Adeptus Sororitas armies. Uh, yeah. Which I would think is pretty badass. Uh, and could be used in a whole range of different game systems as well. Um, the second of the releases is uh, Saint Ambrosia, a lady of healing, as you see there. Again, slightly Not sticking to that kind of like fantasy realm. Um, the thing that I quite liked about this is that I... I like to imagine that that isn't wine. <laughs> yeah. I like to think that that's actually blood. Oh, uh, yeah. weirdly, I, I defaulted to blood being blood. <laughs> so did I. At no point yeah. did I even think it was wine. Yeah, yeah you could do it. a lot more about us. Yeah, yeah it does. That's true. That's true. It says a lot that St. Ambrosia, the first place my mind was going to, was custard as well. So. <laughs> Devon knows. <laughs> it makes it Very good. Uh, but she'd be a pretty awesome fit for, again, any kind of Adeptus Sororitas, kind of Sister of Battle style armies. Or maybe you were going down the route of creating something a little bit more sort of fey and building around like Bretonians and stuff, mm. going back to kind of like old school Warhammer fantasy and things. That could be pretty nice. Also, depending on how you paint her, you could also run her as some kind of vampire figure or something if yep. you really wanted to. She, or she is floating, just like the swan below she her. Is floating. Yeah. You know, yeah. all the legs are kicking like mad. <laughs> the top half is just perfectly serene. Serene yeah. panic, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's exactly what's happening below my chest area here. We are <laughs> doing the weekenders. Um, we also have a couple of bundles as well that come with limited edition models. So these are kind of released every year by Raging Heroes for you to pick up some quirky little minions for you to use in your games. Uh, you have the Sisters Minion Pack, 
which is pretty nice. I like the idea of using these uh, as your warband in its entirety mm. for perhaps yeah. like a game of, uh, I don't know, Frostgrave or something. Imagine this is your little oh, oh, yeah. pack of minions that are sort of wobbling. Otto is particularly good. Exactly. Can I get closer to Otto? <laughs> oh, hello, Otto. Hang on. Oh. Hang on, us. I'm just going to move us to one side so we can have a look at Otto. What is going on there? Like a squid in a suit of armour. He looks so vulnerable, doesn't he? Bless Could him. be a squid. Yeah. Could, could be a, a a good one for sludge or turnip. Very much so, yeah. Because yeah. they yeah. have that surreal, bizarre They, they really do. Yeah. The, other, the, way, the other way you could look at these is perhaps you could see them as servitors and you could use them as like objective markers in your games of perhaps grimdark Warhammer 40,000 if you wanted mm. to as well, which would be quite nice. Oh. Always nice to have something that's a little bit different from a, you know, a gem or something on the tabletop. Oh, um, they, these are certainly different, yeah. Yeah, Otto's face certainly looks like rooting as well. I'm just thinking about turning <laughs> yes. as well. Yeah, very nice. roots. You could actually yeah, just paint it up as like a turnip or something. Mm. Or like the roots of a, a, carrot? a potato or a carrot. Yeah, that'd be nice. Oh my God, yeah, point, paint them up in bright orange. <laughs> <laughs> Or purple, as they used to be. Yeah. 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 Uh, we also have uh, another set as well. So this is the Resurrection Force for um, for Easter, which comes with a whole range of their winged individuals for you to use in your Ooh. games. Um, some really cool models, very dynamic. Um, make sure you've got a lot of foam when you're carrying these guys around. Uh, but that also comes with the Rabbit Lulu, as you can see at the bottom left. Um, so you've got another awesome miniature to throw into your games. You could take that Rabbit Lulu, put her alongside the other minions that we saw in the other pack, and then suddenly you've got your leader for your little warband as they go around the, the ruins of a, a forgotten city. I think it's pretty cool. It yeah. suddenly makes it quite sinister having it for Turnip, considering she's uh, got a hamsters rabbit, yeah. of um, carrots. She, her, she maybe yeah. eats her companions when she's hungry. There we go. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. is a way of life in the <laughs> turnip world. Yeah. We <laughs> uh, we've also got uh, a release from uh, the folks over at Cromlech as well. Uh, they always do something quirky and fun for the Easter holidays. And this weekend, they're also going to be giving away the Easter egg gnaw, which you see there. Um, apparently, this is how all gnaws are hatched. There we go. There's some more for you, which is really cool. Um, no law. No law. Oh, my God. Yeah. There we go. Uh, the oh. way that I'd like to approach this is I think this would be perfect for an Easter egg, egg hunt scenario mm. when you're playing games on the tabletop. So maybe you have a couple of different kill teams that are trying to hunt down the golden gnaw. <laughs> well, you know, bestow them. That's great. And, and all that kind of stuff. So instead of hunting down a troll or something in your games, maybe hunt down a little tiny golden gnaw and find see if uh, it doesn't bite your hand off as you go to sort of put a, uh, a leash around it. But, mm. uh, yeah. Very cool stuff. Just indeed. watches it, just pelts around the tabletop, <laughs> hanging into That's things. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I just love the idea. That it's, uh, I like the idea of playing around with it as part of like a scenario piece. And then beyond that, you could use just again use it as uh, a fun miniature in your army uh, that doesn't have to be tied into Easter. Just you know, have something cool and quirky in your in your force. It's oh, kind of yeah. nice. And obviously, it could be used for a range of different games or whatever you yeah. want to do with it, which is which is good. Oh yeah, there's so many games that require an egg hatched. By people, of course. Yeah, Ter- yeah, yeah. Terry Ruxpin experience. <laughs> been a favorite of mine for years. Yeah. And oh. uh, finishing things off as well, um, Free also alerted us that there is a Moonstone version really? of an Easter model that you can pick wow. up as well. So, who would have thunk? Uh, so, yeah, there's the Angry Jackalope, which is limited edition for this weekend as well. Mm. This one is there until thine stocks last. Yes. So, hopefully, fingers crossed, there's still a couple of them left on their web store. Over yep. Saturday and Sunday when you're seeing this as well. Oh, I, um, I imagine they will so. be. They they don't generally do, you know, single figure like limited releases. Limited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they're so, yeah. generally if you're after it and you can get on the web store over the weekend, you'll it's, be good to go. Um, it's good. a great pose. I love the pose. My, of the, course the jackalope, you guys like him. <laughs> the jackalope that I've got, he looks so pensive and docile. Yeah, well, this, it's, it's just this is, like, yeah. like little jack this, funny. This is anger. This is this is gonna pounce on you, Jackalope. This is great. Yeah. And it works just the same way the regular Jackalope does. Um yeah. so you can just use this as a substitute if you haven't already got a Jackalope. Then you know you can get this one. If you've been looking at our unboxings, I actually unbox Good Boris. Way, yeah. Boris um, yeah. this week and mm-hmm. Boris can summon a Jackalope. Uh so it's a way to get him into your force. Uh, mm-hmm. Just to really annoy your opponent. Can you Dead. play a game with literally just Boris and all bunnies? Is that yes. something doable? You well, can have I am Boris, sorry. <laughs> Murder Bunny, and Jackalope in there. If you want to put Boom. a couple of fawns as well, you're sorted. Time to I go know, to the Stone Web Store. I know. <laughs> 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 the branch out to fawns, not when you can just <gasps> put a bunny. 
So yeah, some uh, some fun yeah. Easter releases for you there to go and check out. Uh, do let us know if you've already picked some of these up because uh, mm-hmm. they've been out for a little while, some of them, uh, and it'd be fun to see some painted versions of them. So yeah, cool stuff. I am 100% on board with that. Yep, yep, yep. Right. Uh, on to the show proper then. Um, we're going to kick yeah. things off, as always, with the most important thing. The only reason people keep coming back. <laughs> uh, there must be a reason for it. It can't just be my dashing good looks. <laughs> Mostly that. Uh, but it is time for the Indie of the Week. Mm. And this week, uh, this week actually is a suggestion via the medium of the rotund one. Uh, so, <laughs> why, what was that giggle for? Rotund. <laughs> rotund one. Yeah. Uh, weebles wobble, but sometimes Warren will send us messages. He will, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and he went, have you seen this? Mm. And we went, no. Uh, yeah, anyway, yeah. And you should have a look at this then, because it's 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 a very nice story. It's an interesting story <laughs> yeah. and um, a fascinating mm. range as well, I suppose. Yeah. So, um, if you want to know the full ins and outs of it, there is a Facebook mm-hmm. post over at Impact Miniatures, mm-hmm. um, which explains everything that has happened to mm-hmm. bring them to this point, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, and Impact, if people aren't aware, Impact have been. The reason there's a blood bowl now from Games Workshop is because Impact. They make about a billion teams a year. <laughs> these guys have been keeping <laughs> the yeah. Blood Bowl community yeah. serviced for years. So yeah. uh, if you were looking to pick up things like Willy miniatures or Wiley miniatures, whatever way that's pronounced, I think it's both. I think there is a Willy and a Wiley miniature. Anyway, if you were looking to pick up their teams, you could get them from Impact. They do 3D sculpting, they do a whole host. Yeah. Most of this page is devoted to fantasy football teams of which there are numerous. That's not the bit we're going to be looking at today, though, because we're no. fickle like that. Um, <laughs> we may come back to it. We, 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 yeah, we may come back now, to it in future. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, because the, we could literally just spend all our time in mm-hmm. the in the teams for fantasy football and never get any mm-hmm. further. Um, but essentially, um, an old line, Heartbreaker Miniatures from back in the 90s. 90s, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of people will know Heartbreaker. Uh, a lot of the the sort of the sculpting collective from the Nottingham area did a lot of work for Heartbreakers. So this, the mm. same sort of names that you would see connected to Games Workshop, Citadel, Marauder, um, who'd you call them? Grenadier, you know, all of these these sculptors who would ply their trade throughout the various sort of uh, companies also did a lot of work for Heartbreaker. Uh, unfortunately, it went away and was sort of defunct for a while uh, until being picked up by, ooh, you know the name. Chris uh, Ed. Yeah, so the 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 sort of the heartbreaker line was sort of the brainchild of of Chris Bledsoe, mm-hmm. who um sort of bought it, as you say, in the in the in the late 90s, and was it created a range that was used for by a lot of people, and it featured, as you can see here, um <laughs> sculpts from some of the best in 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 the in the range. So you've got things like got people like Tim Brown, Kev Adams in the, in this mix. Um but the the unfortunate thing was that Chris uh, passed away, um, unfortunately, back in the uh, when he was trying to sort of get everything off the ground, and so the the range felt like it was going to disappear, which was a massive shame. But uh, his dad, Kevin Bledsoe, stepped in and basically got a hold of everything that Chris had ever done, which is these amazing miniatures from some of the most talented sculptors in the in the in the area, and then was talking with. Uh, impacts uh, Thomas Anders and a whole bunch of other people about trying to bring it back. And so that's where ZN Miniatures came in. This was like an attempt to revive the range and get it back out there. Um, Unfortunately, things sort of like stepped in the way and ZN Miniatures didn't really get the sort of gain the ground that it needed to continue. Mm. And so the kind of the range almost languished for a little while. Um, But the really nice thing about it was that Kevin wanted to do the best by his son and so just didn't get rid of anything, which I think is a really cool thing. Um, and it means that we're not deprived of these sculpts. Um, mm. And so then what happened was uh, a couple of years after that, uh, Kevin got in touch with, with Anders and, and Impact Miniatures. And from that point on, they were like, boom, right, let's see if we can bring all these miniatures back onto the tabletop. And so <laughs> as, as in the, the Facebook post, which I will link down in the yeah. uh, description if you can go and check, go check it out, sent him a pallet's <laughs> worth of molds and sculpts and old metal models and everything uh, that then impact picked through piece by piece 
and uh, they basically went, this is so cool. We are going to make sure we bring all of this back to the tabletop. Uh, and so a lot of people will actually remember back in 2018, we, we covered this on the weekender, but mm. Impact did a Kickstarter, mm. uh, which was called the Lost Minis Project. Now, the Lost Minis Project was the uh, was dealing with a whole range of different companies that had produced miniatures that were then no longer available mostly on on different web stores. Mm -hmm. Uh, But one of those ranges was this particular collection. And so Patrick Keith and some of the other miniatures from Clint Staples as well got kind of built into this. And this enabled um, Impact to finish off everything that Chris had initially planned for this larger collection from Heartbreaker and ZN. Uh, And so it was a really awesome way for the legacy effectively of this range to be continued and brought back to the tabletop. And now it's available forever effectively Mm. through Impact, which I think is an absolutely amazing story. It's fantastic. Um, Yeah. I mean, one of the things that always hits us as war gamers, and we talk about this quite a lot on XLBS and everything as well, and a lot of people talk about it within the community, is that it's like, oh, man, there's this range of miniatures that I, I wish was still around and all that kind of thing. Uh, and this is a testament to people's will to make sure those kind of creative outlets don't get lost forever uh, yeah. or, you know, only exist as eBay purchases. <laughs> and that At kind ridiculous of thing. prices. At ridiculous yeah. prices, yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's just a really nice story. And as you can see here, the miniatures themselves are stunning. Mm. Um, they have that really nice kind of old hammery style vibe to it. Um, and a lot of this stuff would be very, very applicable to a lot of kind of Warhammer fantasy style battles if you want to dive into it. There's a lot of stuff in here as well that's been designed for role-playing games and all sorts of other things as well. Yeah, um, the Heartbreaker yeah. used to do Earth Dawn. That was the one, yeah. yeah. So, Which yeah. was a terrible game. <laughs> I had a friend loved our stone, but I could never get into it. Unfortunately, yeah. But, yeah so. but the miniatures but, are lovely. But yeah, the miniatures are lovely. They're, they're, they've got that really sort of oh. over the top feel to them, which I think is quite mm-hmm. nice. Um, we were talking about this kind of thing when we when we look back at stuff from like War Games Foundry, and yeah. um, when we we're looking at Grenadier as well. Just sort of just character built into definitely. The um, well, that, right there. Ke- I mean, uh, Kev Adams' goblin and orc sculpts are pretty much responsible for the way we see goblins and orcs in yeah. tabletop fantasy gaming because he did so much. He, they call him the Goblin Master for a reason. <laughs> it felt like it felt like anybody who bought a goblin between like yeah. the late eighties and now has bought a Kev Adams sculpt. <laughs> That's all there is to it. It's even yeah. got his own website now. We'll have to look at that mm. at some point in the future. Yeah, But it means they also have a consistency exactly. across That's very true, yeah. five yeah. different companies and mm-hmm. 40 years. You know, you can pick these up and set them down beside mm. some of the stuff he's sculpting today and it will yeah. be seamless almost. So mm. I'm all, it's one of, it was one of the nice things hearing about, because there was a couple of uh, times where Patrick Keith had actually talked about trying to replicate this style and things. And, mm. and, and Keith had specifically said, I wanted to try and make it as true to the yeah, old seamless. lines as possible. Yeah. Um, yeah, which I think is amazing. So imagine this shiny new one right on the left <laughs> is probably there to add because it doesn't have the dating yeah. that the others do, yeah. which is yeah. 94, I think, for this one. 96 wow. there. But I, I love how chunky all these things are. Like you, can, you look at these and you're like, God, that's going to weigh a lot when it's on space. Mm. <laughs> sweet, sweet lead. I think it's really cool. Yeah. Mm. But, uh, yeah. Um, one, one of the nice things is, like, obviously we can see all the fantasy armies and things mm. that they did as part of um, Heartbreaker. But one of the cool things is, if you look over on the ZN page, uh, yes. Jerry, you can see some of the more quirky stuff that they've done. Right. So this kind of feeds into the role play side of things, uh, where they did all these sort of Earth Dawn miniatures and things. So you have the like really cool like dinosaur people and things, mm-hmm. which I think is great. Um, and true to form, this is a collection tiny that picture. has very tiny pictures. Tiny picture. <laughs> because, no, you know, I couldn't do an old school range without tiny pictures, right? Oh, um, is it tidy or is it just very far away? He's a dwarf well, no. as well, dwarf yeah. paladin. I think it's a combination of the two that's done. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just this wealth of amazing and quirky different miniatures that you could use for mm. your games. Um, and as I say, like because these were designed for role-playing games, they've got loads of character built into them and that kind of thing. You could easily pick some of these up and just slot them in alongside a lot of yeah, more modern ranges. And you'd have, 
you know, a really nice, uh, really nice and very unique character. Mm. Some of the ones that actually were sort of bought back um, and like really built on were the Ulfherder, which are like mm. those sort of wear creatures, which I think are amazing. Um, oh, really cool. Slightly confrontation esque, mm. a little bit. Maybe not in the head, but with the rest of the model, I thought it was kind of cool. But uh, weirdly, it was the head. I immediately went, yeah, mm, yeah. Oh well, there <laughs> we go. I was just thinking the armor was very yeah. confrontation, but uh, yeah, very rack of, but. Uh, but yeah, there's some really nice little bits and pieces in there that are very different um, from what from what you might have. You had me at dinosaur people, Ben. There we go. Yeah, we, we know <laughs> that the most important question to ever ask is, you know, what's your favourite dinosaur? That's the exactly. Yeah, one hundred percent. It didn't just do fantasy though, so there's also uh, oh, nice no, sci-fi. ZN also did um, steampunk airships. Ooh, yeah. So if you if you like your weird punk. Mm-hmm. You could, I mean, you could do some weird stuff with a billion you suns could. with these. You could do, yeah, yeah. That would be kind of cool. Sort of going for like a steampunky billion sun. Yeah, uh, yeah. Besher Smith bomber packs, monitor <laughs> scouts, prowlers. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's that's delightfully weird, and also very <laughs> far away. I like that in the clouds, in the distance. So. I like it it's, <laughs> it's four massive brass balls. Yeah. Now we know where GW got their idea for their uh, the crab dwarves from. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fairly certain there should be something else here from ZN, dum, 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 which isn't on the ZN page, weirdly. I have to scroll down here. No, maybe not. Maybe I'm freaking out in my old age. It, it, brought, up an, am. it brought up an interesting thing um, that sort of came up in the comments as well and the, the Facebook post and all that kind of stuff as well was that the, the guy who runs Impact was talking about how it would be really nice uh, if like people continued legacies for ranges mm-hmm. even after the original creators of these uh, all passed away um, and I think that's something that a lot of companies should like start to look at I think um, mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't want to sound too down in the dumps yeah, but yeah. you know we've moved on quite a way since the 80s and 90s and a lot of those sculptors who created those original ranges are yeah. you know in their their later years um not you know nowhere near the grave but you know, <laughs> in their later years and so having things in place i think to be able to mm. continue the lines of miniatures is a really good way to keep people abreast of where we came from um because clicky. No, clicky. i think one of the one of the nicest things is you, you like you can look at all the new games workshop stuff but you want to see where it all began. And I think that's what why people are so enamored by sort of old hammer miniatures. Um, and even within more modern ranges, I think it's nice to be able to look back at stuff that you maybe Mantic did when they first came out and then look at where Mantic are now. I think it's really nice to see that progression. Um, and, you know, these miniatures, as you're seeing here, would be absolutely perfect for gaming right now. You know, oh, yeah. all, most of them are going to be one piece. They're going to be easy to paint. The wa- washes will make them pop as well because of all the metal detail and stuff so yeah and there's so many weird and wacky games these days that have yeah you know a low model count and Mm -hmm. miniatures at miniature agnostic uh rule sets so you can just go well i fancy playing this and i'm going to use these guys well i mean these guys this is these are in effect more time war bands or something if you really wanted to Mm -hmm. go for it or frostgrave war bands Characters for Ranger of Shadow Deep and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. You could do whatever you wanted with these. Dark Paladin. Yeah. They're fantastic. <laughs> They're all so unique, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. Every single one of them. Because I didn't know that I needed a dual pistol rat man until now. <laughs> really? <laughs> I'm shocked. I thought that would be sure, costly for everybody. For dual pistol I know, man. you're right. <laughs> Yeah. That's how Jared found Oakbound Studios. <laughs> He's looking for um black powder weapon wielding rap men. Yeah. But this this goes back to the, the, the nice thing about this, they're all unique because this goes back to a time when you didn't have a large amount of models within armies. They weren't like, you know, yeah. hundreds of models big if you're unless you were playing something like historics. You know, that's really cool. And that that's the other thing that's really nice about this. I bet. You could look through this range mm. if you're a, a, a miniature collector of a certain vintage, and I bet you could look at this and be like, "Oh my right. god, I have that those. vintage." <laughs> yeah. That's what you're saying. Okay, yeah. but yeah, I bet you'd be like, "Oh my god, I have that, and I wish I'd also had that." Well, mm. awesome. Impact actually do all these, so you can go and get them again. Which That's really fantastic. Yeah, so. yeah, I'm 100 on board with that, and yeah, the 
it's nice to go onto something like Stuff of Legends and look at the old catalogs and look at the old ranges from various companies and go, oh, that was good. I remember that. I wish I'd had that. It's even better to actually being able to buy yes, them. Very much um, so. And having Impact obviously deciding to continue the curation of the <laughs> um, of, of ZN Games to continue the sort of Heartbreaker legacy is great um, because it would be so easy just to, to you know, these could be warehoused and then... Um, when Kevin passed away then, so his, obviously his son had passed away years ago, but where he passed away recently, that if this hadn't have been arranged beforehand, auction maybe, scrapyard more bin, likely, yeah. you know, uh, and that's that's yeah. a whole chunk of some uh, really that, spanking yeah. miniatures just was, it, was, it was one of the things that the, the Impact said about this, that they were so surprised that Kevin didn't just get rid of the stuff because a lot of a lot of times you know a lot of things that they use for businesses just end up in skips yeah um or you know melted down or something whereas yeah. these where well, kevin has actually done so much to That's continue amazing. his son's legacy um, how lovely so yeah yeah no I'm, I'm really loving loving the fact that it's it's still out there it's still available for people and um definitely worth checking out if you fancy having a, a selection of miniatures heroes war bands whatever it happens to be for various games i mean there's not a week goes by where we don't see another game where you're just going well all i need is half a dozen models of uh, <laughs> yeah to play that you know or or yeah. somebody will do like um like the growling badger whatever it was called game um where you're lords of hell you go well i just need some some demon looking things oh, to fight right each other. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. and then you just go all right well grand well here's a bunch of Really random looking yeah. things. <laughs> that I'm fairly certain my opponent won't have. No, <laughs> pick those up for so. You're not going to get confused on the table. Uh, no, yeah. you are not. Yeah, no, it's it's fantastic to see, and uh, well done, Warren, for spotting that mm. little legend. He's said with us, in large s- legend. <laughs> He's with us in spirit, providing yeah. the indie of the week. There we go. Just it. didn't get shouted at you this week. No, That's no, true. it didn't. Everybody's eardrums are secure for another mm-hmm. week. Well done, you. <laughs> right. Uh, we're going to take a quick switch, and when we come back, we'll take a look at the news. Coming to you from the center of Northwestern Europe. Covering board games, war games, card games, and all that shit you love. It's the Muck f- News. <laughs> so, back with some tabletop gaming news. Uh, we're going to be starting things off with a heavy old dollop of nostalgia uh, as we look back in time to the masters of the universe, oh. but also Man. new models that have come out from uh, Archon uh, Studio. Mm-hmm. So uh, you may remember that they were doing a, um, a Kickstarter for a Masters of the Universe board game. Mm-hmm. Well, in addition to that, they have also released this new game, which is called Masters of the Universe Battleground. As you can see, only ships to specific EU countries. Mm. So if you're an American, then I suggest you have a friend in the, in Europe who will send yeah. it to you. <laughs> yeah. It works both ways yeah. sometimes. Exactly. You, know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, can, you can do a partnership, you see, with the Simon game that comes out. You can ship it both ways. Boom. There you go. You've got all the He-Man goodness. But anyway, so this is a two-player game uh, where one side will take on the role of the Master of the Universe. And then yeah. the other side will take on Skeletor, take on the role of Skeletor and his companions, and you will battle it out for supremacy on that really awesome looking hex based board, as you can see there. Mm. In the set, you get two uh, packs, well, two sprues of plastic miniatures. On the one side, you have He Man, Man at Arms, Stratos, Orko. Orko and Ram Man as well, which is pretty cool. Oh, right. I I love these old naming conventions. It's so fun. <laughs> I, I mean, they Why? didn't they didn't let go on the uh, on the abs there, did they? They they no, really no, didn't. No, no, no yeah. detail lost there for Hey Man. Yeah. I was going to say as well. I think of all of these, my favourites are probably Stratos and uh, and and Man at Arms. I think they look really badass, and they're very they're very in keeping with the classic sort of cartoon toys yeah. and stuff like that from back in the day, which is really awesome. Ram Man is the worst. <laughs> just saying. Ram well, Man is the worst. I owned Ram Man and he was yeah. the worst because he was just, he was hard plastic unlike the rest. Uh, he had no points of modulation. What? You compressed oh. him and then he would, uh, he had like a spring inside. So he, you would squish him down and then he would pop up and oh, that was his okay. ramming action. Oh, but I mean, man. he was a 
garbage toy, unlike the rest. Yeah, I'm just, yeah. you know, I yeah. hate you, Ram Man, still. <laughs> I remember having a Stratos Pizza. toy, and all the wings moved, and the arms yeah. moved. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, oh Stratos was, cool. was great. Stratus Man, was awesome. great. They were all great, yeah. except... We're lucky at yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. oh, man. man of Times had like a gun arm that could fire little plastic things yeah. at your brother. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was exactly what you were supposed yeah. to use it for. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, so on the one side, you've got these really awesome miniatures here for, for, for the, the Masters of the Universe themselves. And on the <laughs> other side, you have equally amazing miniatures. So you've got Skeletor there in the centre. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm so <laughs> glad. I am so, so happy. Uh, you the skeleton have done anything else. <laughs> Skeletor memes are the best memes. Mm-hmm. Uh, go and find some online. There are some really good ones at the moment. Uh, there's also uh, the model for Evil Lynn mm-hmm. there at the back, which is pretty cool. You've got Trapjaw. <laughs> I had a, a version of Trapjaw. And he actually had a little cool moving Trapjaw and his arm fired little things as well. It was very nice. That would, wouldn't it? Day. Yeah. You've also got Merman as well. Mm. Um, the naming conventions for villains in the, uh, in the olden days were pretty on point, <laughs> weren't they? Uh, and then you've also got Triclops, who uh, has the little spinny uh, head. Obviously, yes. not a miniature, but he has a spinny head with the different eyes that do different things, which is pretty cool. So, if you are a uh, a child of um, the last century, basically, mm-hmm. uh, and you really like your Master of the Universe, and this is definitely one to dive into and have fun with. Uh, I never got these things firsthand; but I always got them secondhand at car boot sales, but they were amazing. They were really cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's nice to have these. Uh, sort of ported over from the board game into another board game uh, that is quick and easy to play and dive into. So the game itself, as I say, is a two-player affair. Mm-hmm. Take on either side and you fight for control of the of the, of the the tabletop, beating each other up, as you do. Um, in addition to that, you've also got a whole bunch of stuff in there for, for a sort of customizing games. So you've got lots of gear and abilities and all that kind of thing mm-hmm. too. So it's one of those board games that's very self-contained. Uh, it's been designed basically as a sort of like this is it you can play it as many times as you like and just see who wins every time you sit down to play um, it actually plays quite quickly as well so it's pretty cool so if you were diving in and you want to like maybe play two or three games of an evening you could probably do that as well which is quite nice so yeah maybe have some Master of the Universe on in the background as you're doing it so, yeah. that's true yeah. fascinating stuff and interesting to see that they haven't just gone with the I want to say it was Battle for Eternia. Was that the name of the the big yes. game, which was kind yes. of a hex mappy strategy game where they've gone yeah. well, you know, we've got the we've got the figures, we can do something a bit different, light and a bit more like let's face it, the like an uh, old game, the, from like the, back he- in the day as well, well yeah. like the Hebrew <laughs> TV series. Here's <laughs> yes, our heroes, here's yeah. our villains, and let's let's. Smash. What do they do today? Fight, <laughs> smash the tire of each other in front of Grayskull, because um, yeah. you mm-hmm. know that's just how these these mm-hmm. things happen. I should also happen. say. That that set come you saw the terrain on the on the game board there. That yeah. plastic terrain comes in the set. Nice. So you've actually got some really cool three D elements to it as well. Just quite lots nice. in a box. So, all about the three D elements. Mm. You probably will need some glue though. So there we go. Yeah, no, one hundred percent. You will need glue. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There are multi parts sprues, yeah. um, but definitely worth a look at it anyway. Yeah. Um, sticking with things from the past, <laughs> our next story. Is, well, you know, He Man very much is things from the past. <laughs> Um, but we have a new mini campaign coming from uh, Warhost for their Baron War. So this is gutted at Galliard. Uh, not to be confused with Mr. Dalliard, who was, of course, a Russian operative. <laughs> Again, if you know that reference, you are old. Um, but this is the, I won't say fourth, might be fifth, but certainly, certainly at least the fourth mini campaign for the Baron War. Um, from foot sword miniatures and games, uh, which is another step along the road of uh, building up your forces for the Barons Wars. So it's a uh, essentially a slow grow campaign, um, allowing you to build up your force as you fight out a um, historic siege, uh, and uh, it works between uh, Graham de Bar and William Marshall, who have got a. Uh, a couple of spanking figures. In fact, I think William's got four figures now because you've got him hatted and unhatted yes, yeah, as yeah, well. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he is the poster boy for the Barons War. Um, <laughs> but it allows you to uh, put together your force as you attempt to go and lock horns in the uh, early Middle Ages. And uh, I, I quite like how they're doing these. I think um, it's an interesting idea that you can dip into specific parts. So we've seen... Um, a large campaign system with death and taxes already. Uh, but then these little smaller packs that you pick up as, uh, I won't say they're like three pound PDFs and they're like 15, 20 pages long. You get your sort of force lists, the scenario specific rules that you need. You get uh, an, 
historical narrative or historical fiction. So it it, it has the story told narrative to you nice. about what actually happened and then you can go and do uh, the unusual sort of scenario so we've already seen um, the sheriff of nottingham being attacked by some peasant outlaws in sherwood forest and uh, <laughs> yep. and now we've got this where you know you two can uh, besiege across a, a rake of boats yeah some uh, cool for, bits of siege warfare yeah yeah, yeah. it's a uh, fascinating stuff to to see from them as they sort of constantly expanding mm -hmm. uh, the baron's war range um and giving people not just it's not just here's your rule book you're done and dusted move on uh you can play as many games as you want but there's constant sort of drip thread uh content coming for the barons war which is very good because it keeps the game alive and in in people's uh eye view as well so if if you didn't get into it originally and you're curious as to how the sort of barn war plays out uh, it's it's probably worth having a look at some of these smaller scenario packs um and then see exactly what you need you don't need to pick up the full collection in one go you just need to pick up a, a small amount of um knights squires retainers uh, and off you go uh, especially now that they're starting to move into the crusades as well i imagine we'll see more out uh, is coming in may yep, yeah yeah we'll, so. we'll, we'll see other interesting things coming with the, the the various sort of um knights of christ as they start lamping around themselves in the Holy Land, uh, but uh, the other thing is, I, we also we often get a, an impression of medieval battles as being these huge sprawling affairs, uh, but really, you know, a couple of dozen figures aside was huge when it came to this sort of warfare. In most cases, they were more or less like skirmishes. That the, the yeah. huge Hastings and Stamford Bridge like battles were a rarity in the grand scheme of things um and generally only when a question was being posed to one side or the other so yeah i think these uh these campaign packs are the way to go and, and gives you a good idea of how the the period actually played mm -hmm. out in most cases as well yeah so if you fancy getting gutted <laughs> then uh you should check out the new mini campaign for the baron's war from warhost uh if you've not been to the warhost website they have a, a like a list builder and stuff on it as well so i think the links are at the bottom of the futsal page when you go on there if you're picking it up you can then pop in and you can uh, work out what sort of things uh you can take in your force which is handy because it gives you a rough idea of what you might want to buy yeah Let's they, face it. they do also tend to do sort of bundles every so often so yeah. you'll see bundles popping up on their web store that are sometimes themed around the mini campaigns yeah. sometimes they're just idea. a nice collection of new stuff um so you might spot some on there that are like this is this would be great for gutted go and yeah. this one. Or, or here are the characters for uh lacklands yeah. mm -hmm. i want to say it's lacklands revenge but i know it's not that mm -hmm. but anyway yeah so you see you can pick up the the figures piecemeal and build your collection over time and probably a better way of doing it than just Sounds going like i will i will buy a bucket load of miniatures now <laughs> consider consider cleaning them up over the next seven to eight months <laughs> but anyway uh so free moving away from miniatures and getting to standees little standees facts. hello hero mm -hmm. forge have added acrylic standees to their store and they're only $9.99. I don't know what the exact translation <laughs> is, but they're $9.99. Is it $9.99? They're $9.99. That's that that went off quid? a cliff there. They're only That's seven quid. Dollars. Dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, I think it was about 12 quid or something. Oh, but, well, there you yeah. go. So they're, they're lower price than the 3D printed miniatures that normally start oh, at about yes. $19.99. <laughs> um, so they're a great way to just showcase your character on the table, really. So I just think they'll be great um, for monsters, NPCs as well. It's, for me, it just strikes me as a, light, a nice, expensive way to get characters out on the table. And it's just a really cool introduction on hero fold really because we have been saying like about the abundance of miniatures in board games and rpgs and jerry often says about you know can't you how do you feel about standees in rpgs is that the same role yeah <laughs> I, I don't need to move something around a board if you tell me i'm in a room with three of my mates and there are two skeletons against this wall and there's a chair and a table in front of me i, I can imagine that <laughs> i don't need to see a little flat thing or well, uh, miniature, but you know, <laughs> if you're not as talented as Jerry as the creative sense of that, you can get some standings as well. Mm. But for 
if it's just a potential solution for a lot of people that don't want something 3D out on the table, mm. want to get a high quality graphic of their character, just as a quick reference. It's quite interesting, me, due to the nature of the print, really, because you can have as much attached as possible without having an effect to the print as you would have 3D. It can be more top heavy. You can get people levitating a bit easier because you've mm. got the absent space in the bottom. So it does remove the, the you know, worry what your print's going to turn like if it's something thick that's going to come out of the bottom. But you're going to definitely get more detail out of the graphic by the end of it. Um, I yeah, do, I, yeah. I, one thing I really do love about these because of travel, they do come flat pack from the bases. Mm. So they're just like a kind of a slotting mechanic. So it's interesting because when you're doing it, you design it in the same way that you design your miniature. So yeah. you could have them floating. My samurai demon. You can have them floating. Uh, you can have them pointing, chuckling around, whatever you want to do. Yeah. The interesting thing for me is when you come to bias, do you have to p- specify the orientation? Because yes, obviously these are completely do. 3D. Yeah. Um, so when, when it comes to the standy option, if you go to uh, the buy section and have a look at it, I think mm-hmm. you should uh, see the option when you go to standees. You, the orientation that you have is how that will come. So if that's you really cool. Like that, then it'll come like that, and you'll see the front of the Ah, right. Out. So, ah, uh, so you orientate it here, and then that's whatever you're looking that's at. That's what it looks like, yeah. Oh, so, well, and then the flip to the other side shows you what it looked like on the back. That's so really you can, cool. You can always look at how it's going to appear before you sit down and before you get it effectively, which I think is quite nice. So you choose everything about the miniature, which I think, again is always good when it comes yeah. to this here for stuff. The other thing that I really like about this. Is that, and we've seen this with some of the stuff that we've done with Hero Forge in the past. Mm-hmm. The color prints and things that they do are nice, but you have to very go very vibrant with them. Yes. However, however, you could look at coloring your miniatures using the program, and mm-hmm. then get them as standees, and they'll look exactly as yeah. they were when you designed them. If you know what I mean, you're not going to yeah, have to worry I, about they'll, they'll fading keep, or anything like that. So. They'll keep that without losing any sort of softening yeah. to the print process. Yeah. yeah, and then obviously it's not a miniature at that point, but you've still got a representation of your character on the tabletop yes. that I think is a pretty damn high quality, to be honest. So uh, I like, it's the transportation for me, because if you're taking six characters, whether it be MP- NPCs, you're literally just going to get them off the base and then put them down, flat pack them into, and it's just going to save so much more hassle yeah. leaving and taking them with you. I just think it's a really, really cool introduction to Hero Force that's going to help a lot of people in representing their character on the tabletop. Mm. Also a lot, it's also a lot nicer on either the person in your group who has to paint the miniatures or your DM, um, because then if you don't carry on your campaign after four or five, uh, you know, sessions or whatever, at least you only paid nine nine ninety. Oh, yeah, exactly. Or something. So yeah. <laughs> nine ninety nine dollars. Dollars. Yeah. Dollars. Nine ninety nine dollars. I will okay. say that one wasn't nine ninety nine dollars. Oh. It's because it, is it cause it's, cause XL? it's XL. There are two yeah, yeah. sizes. You, get a big you have regular and XL. And if you go into XL, it pushes it up to twelve ninety nine dollars. 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 <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah, so that is something to look out for yeah. if you are buying them. I wonder where they're going to come from because I, obviously they print in the Netherlands for Europe. Mm-hmm. So if you order in the US, you'll get it from direct from the US. If you order in Europe or UK, you'll get yeah. it from the Netherlands. But I don't know if. The facility that is set up to do the three D printing here is also set up to do mm. the acrylic and laser cutting. It would be interesting, but, yeah. I'm not sure or, or they may end up being shipped directly from the states, depending. So, yeah. Yeah. It is in the, I think you were saying in the beta. It's still, still in the beta stage. Yeah, yeah. 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 So it's going to take. I think it's up to kind of five weeks plus yeah. to ship potentially, depending because they are still testing it out in the minute. So. But it does look like a good move, and it's quite something. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Absolutely fantastic idea. More standees. Boom. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I think we know what next week's uh, India of the Week will be. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be looking at some standees. <laughs> Essentially. Yeah. Right. Mm. Off to the wonderful world of armoured fighting vehicles. <gasps> yes. Da, da, da. I was like, well, John's with us again. And I can't talk about anything with any kind of uh, believability, as I have proven. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, the folks over at Victrix have put together a new selection of World War II vehicles in 12 millimeter for mm-hmm. the Victrix Games um, range. Um, they've done M7 Priests, Sextons, and Pumas. And because I know nothing about any of these, John, take it away. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
<laughs> your um your your priests and the sextons your your the priest is basically the same vehicle as the sexton except um it has a pulpit on it hence why it's mm -hmm. called a priest <laughs> as a pulpit with a machine gun on it and has the american 105 gun on it whereas the sexton has the british 25 pounder field gun mounted on it instead apart from that exactly the same vehicle um just good piece of mobile artillery um very prevalent after D-Day as well, I think. Were they found in like lots of different theaters? That's the thing that I was interested yeah. about with this. Like, was it not was it just a European thing? Would they find in North Africa and, and all they that I've seen them in I've seen them in North Africa slash Italy, more so Italy, because I don't think there was many of them around because Sherman right. was only coming online around the North African campaign. Mm. So this sort of stuff kind of followed up after that, but definitely through Italy. Um mm -hmm. I'm gonna I'm gonna lean on Jerry here and say, have we seen them? Did we see them in the Pacific much? I think we did. Phone a friend. Phone <laughs> a friend. I, I don't honestly I don't, I don't know. know. If they, I don't. I don't know if they appeared in the Pacific. They may be <laughs> kicking in around um, some of the the lamb campaigns in yeah. Burma and that neck of the woods. Because most of the time, the Americans had ships for artillery. So yeah, yeah. When you're not fighting across a very large island, there's no point in deploying artillery that will sort of. There's no point in having a, an artillery piece that will only shoot three miles when you've got a ship <laughs> offshore shooting 20 miles inland. Yeah. You know? the, other thing, the other thing I was reading when I looked at this is that they weren't, like, while they've been done up with kind of American livery and that kind of thing, they, they were like made by Canadians and then hmm. used by the British and the rest of the Commonwealth had them as well. So well, they seem like they're fairly well used. In that that's that's, that's definitely guards' armor. Right, so yeah. that's British. Yeah. Yeah. Fulham, I bet you could probably tell which regiment that is if you knew what you were looking at. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the standard, you know, yeah. everything starts with the same letter. That's why we've got yeah. Cromwell's yeah. with like Corian and Cavan and Yeah. yeah. Well, it was more um what regiment it was, like mm. Irish Guards, for example. Okay. A squadron, well, HQ squadron tanks were named after cities mm -hmm. in Ireland. Then you had a, a, B, and C squadron who all had tanks named after towns tanks. beginning with A, B, or yeah. C. So, oh, okay. That's cool. That's so, kind of the, the methodology behind yeah. it. So I, I imagine it's, it's will be similar for this then. Where yeah, got it's however the artillery. Dagwood, Fun, Fair, and Fulham there. So. The, other, the other thing I was interested in with, uh, with these, and we can look at the other vehicles they've got, <laughs> they've got coming up as well, is what do you th think about the accuracy of these? Because these are 12 mil. So I was interested to see whether or not they were like, yes, that's exactly how I would have imagined them, or are there are a few things missing that have been done for the sake of scale or anything, or, or are they pretty on point? No. They're they're as on point as you can be. I mean, we've right. we've seen sextons and priests in so many different scales. I've seen real <laughs> ones right down to 15 mil and looked at them and went, yeah, I mean, it's all much of a muchness. There's mm. only so much detail you can stick into something at 12 mil. Yeah. Um, the vehicle looks right in principle. That's as much as I can. And that's say what that's what's the most important thing for gaming, I guess. At that point, yeah, yes. yeah. If so you we'll can look... recognize what it is, yeah. yeah. For these, know your phone. yeah, for these um kits, because I put together some of the Panthers, they are limited build, because at that scale, you don't want to be messing around trying to put yeah. individual <laughs> track wheels and bogies yeah. and you know, no, not a home to that. So, <laughs> it. it these things could potentially only be maybe three or four parts, um, and they are Just pop it all together. smaller yeah. than smaller than my thumb. I, I reckon and, uh, you've got so. a you've got the the gun, the gun and the gun mount are probably one piece. The upper hull is probably one piece. The lower hull is probably one piece. The tracks are two separate pieces. Uh, definitely the crew are separate because they're all in different positions inside it, so mm. they're yeah. a separate thing. They do. Um, I think they have specific breakdowns of them over on the website. Yeah. Things, but, uh, well, yeah. that's my guess. And if I'm if I'm right, you can tell me in the comments. <laughs> yeah, you can compare the two to see whether or not John was right. That's the. Yeah. <laughs> and then we also had the Pumas. Pumas was kind of cool. There was there is like a full designation for these, but I didn't write it in the in it's, the image descriptions. But <laughs> SDK on. have said two three fours. It's two three. It's two three four dash something. Oh. oh. Hang on. Oh. In the post, <gasps> I want to see if it. It's if the John it's, it's the two three four dash two. Oh, there you go. The two the three Zond four dash two. Z okay. Zonder Zondercraft Zondercraft Kampfwagen something. Kaf okay. SDK yeah. have said. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you would have had fun saying that one, Ben. 
I would have just gone blah 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 blah. Zondercraft <laughs> far Zondercraft far zug. No. Zug. Zug. Something like that. <laughs> That's right. Whatever. I can I can feel Pony's eye twitching from here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah, what, what what can you tell us about the Pumas? Puma Pumas, uh, Puma yeah. or Puma or whatever. It's yeah. um I I would quite happily argue with anybody, like fight me. Um <laughs> by saying that these are sort of the granddaddy of modern armored reconnaissance. Um, because we we have a lot of vehicles today that are eight wheelers that are for reconnaissance are light armored and carry a fairly decent gun. Mm. So, I mean, American striker, I'm looking at you, you may be a piece of crap, but you're, you know, the DNA is there. <laughs> like, a bit like the Puma, to be honest. Um, only, only about 470 of these or 100, 420 of these things were made. Um, uh, you say that, but based on how often I see them on the table, yeah, I feel like thousands, if not millions, of these were produced. Like it's the only thing ever built other than tigers. <laughs> tigers and pumas consisted yeah. of about ninety percent of the air fees for the German military in World War Two. Yeah, well, that's that's um that's your your German military enthusiast talking mm -hmm. there. That's that's, that, that, that's that's a historical fact. They didn't build anything else apart. <laughs> I can't remember if Puma has that weird, quirky thing that it, its predecessor had. The other, the other eight double driver. Yeah. Yes. You knew exactly where it does. It. It still has that. Mm. So here's here's one for Ben and Free, which is totally boring and no one will care about. No, except no. A few people in the comments. <laughs> the the Puma could have the Puma had two driving positions: one looking forward and one looking backward, like an SPV almost. From, yeah. From mm. Spectrum. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it, it has there's a there's a single lever connected to the gearbox that reverses the gears. Oh, and it's not okay. just driving in reverse, it puts every gear in reverse. So wow. the driver okay. can then switch to the other seat to look out the back of the vehicle and drive just as just as fast backwards as he can forwards. Is that was that just to aid the fact that it was like a recon vehicle? Yeah. That kind of thing. Nobody That's, wants to try and do a three point turn in an eight wheeler no. that long. No. When somebody's bearing down on you, it's much easier just yeah. to make the entire internal mechanics go backwards. <laughs> Did it catch on? Uh, the British they, did it with the Dingo. Yeah, they, they did oh, okay. like it. They did it for a few German vehicles. So clearly, yep. clearly, it was one of these things where it, it was sufficiently, it worked sufficiently well enough for them to continue with it, rather than just because yeah. they did it on the the eight rad first, and they didn't go. You know what? That keeps breaking down, or we keep running into problems, <laughs> or, or nobody wants to do that in the middle of an actual engagement. This is just pointless over engineering. They went, no, no, this this is good. We'll get into a bush somewhere, and then when we need to. I hightail it out of there, yeah. leaving the commander in the couple to start giving some covering fire. Well, was I right in reading that they were fairly good at actually hunting tanks, or is no. that just a no? Sort of like, they, oh they, yeah, they're great. They, they could certainly <laughs> hunt them. Wouldn't be able to kill them, right? Yeah. <laughs> so the gun wasn't big enough, basically. The, the, <laughs> the Puma had a fifty millimeter, so it's more of a, a light armor. Okay, like, right. Destroying yeah. other reconnaissance vehicles yeah. if it came across them. Um, there was that version of the, there was the turretless Puma that had the 75 millimeter in it, the <laughs> short barreled howitzer, which again, not a tank killer, but was a infantry support kind of thing Ooh. or bunker buster more than that. Okay. Anything. I thought I had one up there, but it's not, it's an eight rod. Yeah. <laughs> Put it back. They're, <laughs> they're, a, they're a bunch of, they're a real bunch of quirky vehicles, that, that whole series, that, that mm. three fours that are just odd. But then all yeah. German armored cars are just odd. They look weird and you know even a low a low makes fun out of them with the little tank yeah um it's, yeah it's all, it's all about the future so well, the the thing, future proofing yeah. everything the other thing is as well like we i think we talked about this was it last week or maybe the week before that there are some vehicles from world war ii that just look like modern vehicles and i think the puma is one of those that kind of carries over that that thing and, and as you say it's become popular with modern vehicles as well, so yeah very cool it's it's all the straight lines and weird shapes mm. that are yeah, all coming out yeah, now. Yeah. It's like that, that's just a Puma modernized to 2010. You could paint it. You could paint it urban grey, and it would fit into a modern setting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I want to. I want also point out as well that like that's only like a really little snapshot of what Victrix have done. Yeah. We've talked about them in the in the past, but they have a huge range of 12 mil stuff now. So if you're looking to play in that scale, um, then there's. Uh, an abundance of stuff there's all the infantry you could ever want pretty much uh and then they're slowly building up their um their vehicle selection yeah. as well so uh, some really good stuff in there for the allies and the axis so yeah yeah so if you're and i know people be going 12 mil and we've mentioned it before it's not because it's 12 mil 
They haven't picked 12 mil to be odd. They've picked 12 mil because it's a proper scale. It's one 144th. <laughs> <laughs> so if can you buy to, other things you in can that buy scale. other yeah. things in that scale yeah. that is a recognizable Planes, scale yeah. unlike 15 mil and stuff like that that war gamers go oh not 50 i love my large 15 slash 18 mil you're going well, that's not you can't have large 15 15 is 15 it's a number <laughs> and then battle group's like hello 20 <laughs> well, battle, battle group is battle group scale agnostic so yeah. you, you can go for your guns on that one but yeah so if you're interested in um picking up some new bits and pieces uh, to play out your World War II, definitely worth checking out the range that's coming from Vetrix. And yeah, it's just getting bigger and bigger every time I look at it. Where to next then, Free? Well, I really enjoy investigation games mm. and I've had my head stuck into a couple over the past year. Like Exit Games I've really enjoyed and even board games like Mansion Madness and Mysterium from time to time. So if you are looking for a dark and mysterious mystery to decrypt, set in the bleak and macabre 1920s. Borough investigation, investigation into Arkham's and elsewhere, that's the whole title, has caught my eye this week. The big, the long, chunky title has caught my eye this week. So it brings players into 1920 America and you get to explore events inspired by H.P. Lovecraft and you get to delve Ooh. deeper into the unimaginable and sinister threat that are surrounding the Cthulhu mythos. So very, very cool. Nice different way of investigation from the usual Sherlock Holmes and stuff that you get. So if you have played Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective, invest, uh, investigations into Arkham and elsewhere, see, I have to separate the two, they're, mm. um, they're going to be building on the same system. So there's no components such as meeple, cards, dice. You have to get stuck in by looking at the evidence, by decrypting, you flex your mental ability, and you look through each bit of evidence to add to the narrative that's on the table. So you've got to sort through different newspapers, different maps, different directories, and just different physical evidence to try and crack the code. So you'll be stepping into the stews of a detective. And you can imagine it's not exactly smiles, puppies and rainbows with him. Um, you'll belong to the brewer with investigation. So the game is set up for one to eight players and you're going to make your way through five different cases in total. And there's a series of mysteries. They're going to be grim, they're going to be paranormal, and they're going to be extra tentacly in, in the theme of Cthulhu. So Hopefully they'll also be in English because I can't read yes, this. It, it won't just be in French. <laughs> it won't just be in French. <laughs> it won't just be in French. Uh, so it's going to be fun. You get a chance to prepare Pope at Arkham and elsewhere so mm. we can expect this coming out on May the 20th it's the next month so you can test your deducting deducing skills against I, 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 I love these games I've played three or four cases I think from the Sherlock Holmes and sort of yeah. detective set and it's just so different from anything it else is, I've ever done it's um, so much fun you like I think we played it with four of us and we had a notebook where we wrote everything down and we jotted down what everyone was saying when we went to go and visit all the suspects and where they were and their relationships and you like little mind maps and webs and that kind of thing um and there's always a moment when you start one of these especially after you've done it the first time where you sit down and you go right 10 minutes everybody read the paper and we're going to see if we can find anything information wise and you come back after 10 minutes and you feed back to the group which i think is amazing so you're sat there with your beer or your cup of tea just going hmm let's have a look this, at this paper and find out what's going on this is what i really like about these kind of games because when i played uh charlotte before even the quietest members of my group seem to really engage in it um when i'm sitting back and playing a group game you do have some members of my group that's quite happy to sit there quietly but when we get them involved in sherlock holmes or any other investigation type game they're they're speaking more they're more involved in the group and it's a really yeah. nice different way to change it up on the tabletop um, you see that quite nice assuming Sherlock is the same, and it's not just the, the system. What's the quality of the components like? Because I don't have a board gaming group that I play board games with. Not really my bag. However, I will happily murderize people for that, for the cock. Because having, <laughs> you know, it, it's a bunch of maps of Boston it's in 1920. Great idea. It's, it's, you know, according to this, it contains uh, plans and Livres and journals. <laughs> Maps, and journals. <laughs> um, so, I mean, having that for an RPG uh, to throw out, especially because I plan on running a Cthulhu game at the RPG um, day in July. 
if it's uh, if it's anything like the consult detective stuff, then the quality of like the newspapers mm-hmm. is like on point and the math yeah. as well. And then the booklets are normally like a kind of plasticky kind of booklets, mm-hmm. if you know what I mean, like pamphlet kind of style. Right. Um, but they're they're very good. And stuff. But those, those are probably the things that I may or may not be using. Oh yeah, the, the maps and the but newspapers. Besides, but the, things would be yeah, the actual yeah, props really nice. Yeah, they'll feel in world, which is good. Um, mm. so and I think the order from the Historic Society in America. Right. Then I think this kind <laughs> of opens up some really nice options for them to take this elsewhere. So you can obviously do more yeah. stuff for kind of Arkham, obviously, because you know working on that vein of sort of all the Arkham horror stuff yep. that Fancy Flight doing things. But you could easily do a lot more of the stuff. Myth, you could look yeah. into loads of different stuff. You can investigate, and it's a nice yeah. system to use. It is a lot yeah. of fun. Mm, fascinating so, cool. stuff. Yeah. Where are we off to next? Yeah, so uh, we finish things off uh, with a look at what Games Workshop are offering up for pre-order to the gods this weekend. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so we have uh, a bunch of Blood Bowl stuff this time around. Um, we're moving away from Warhammer 40k and One Rage of Sigma and instead going back to the fantasy football of the old world uh, with a look at the new Norska Rampages <laughs> Norse team for use in Blood Bowl. Mm-hmm. Uh, the team comes with your standard berserkers that everybody, everybody will know. Um, from playing the game in the past, alongside the Ulfverner, which you see there in the centre with the big claws and the big beards and the wolf pelts. And then you also have the Valkyries as well, who are kind of act as your sort of, your uh, your, your your scorers, basically. Mm. They're the ones that are going to be scoring all the touch, touchdowns and that kind of stuff. In addition to um, that, you've also got the little beer boar that will be running around to tie on top of all the pints that oh, your Norsemen are carrying around. You can see one in the centre there, looking very nice and cute. <laughs> I still prefer the unhelmeted version, i got to say. Uh, no. You then get a, You like the helmeted one, John? Helmets, yeah. That, that oh, looks God. better. Oh, I don't know. I don't like oh. the unhelmeted one. Okay. Is it weird to say that it looks odd? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's yeah. fine to say it, but you're just... Yeah, like, it looks apparently. very uh, frat housey with the helmet, in my opinion. That is, well, yeah. yeah. It's got a little <laughs> straw coming out of the side or something. Yeah. So. Um, you also get some north themed balls. You get the token that you flip with the heads and tails in it for when you want to kick off. And then you've also got the little sort of um, additional bits and pieces that could be used to build your own stadiums and that kind of thing as well, which is quite nice. So some really nice bits and pieces there. Um, you've also got a whole bunch of uh, so that's plastic mm. so that's going to be available from Games Workshop nice. uh, but Forge World are also stepping in to do the big uns and the um, star players as well so the familiar big un for the Norse is the Yeti so that's going to be stomping into your games and kicking <laughs> ass and taking names why score touchdowns when you could just rip the arms off the opposing players yes <laughs> so yeah the eternal <laughs> question Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's what all dwarf teams do. <laughs> and also what all Kemri teams do. Well, Why would yeah. I score when I'm slow and I could beat you to death? <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, there's also a star player, a Yeti, called uh, Scrog Snow Pelt, who is a, um incredibly well coiffured individual mm. with a good stylist. <laughs> Um, he yeah, he's actually won Beard of the Year apparently <laughs> in the uh, in Fair the Blood Bowl world, yep, which yeah. is quite nice. Makes uh, sense. Looking very cool, uh, a nice sort of option for you to play around with. He can still, as you might imagine, rip the arms off opponents, but he's also a little bit more uh, focused on scoring as well, which is quite nice and dazzling yeah. and, and amazing the crowd at the same time. Yes, yeah. I like that he's still got he's got a comb and a brush in his sort of satchel there mm. for use in the middle of a game. Um, which is quite cool. He is your showman, this one, very much so, yeah. Just such a crying shame that they ran out of time so they didn't get him fully painted. (laughs) Because the Norse team there is clearly in blue and yellow, Mm -hmm. the St. Ivel Gold slash Swedish colours, depending on where you come from in the world. (laughs) And they've got it on the shoulder pad there, and he's got it on his shoulder pads and on his badges, but for some reason it's got a blue and white scarf. That is random, isn't it? I imagine he forgot. That or he just oh no, my model's gone to print. Uh, they, just, they just went. No one, no one's, no one's going to know this. I will. <laughs> I also noticed you've gone over the line there with your. With your really, like, <laughs> I mean, fair. they've come to the show to see this guy quite clearly. Just yeah, one yeah, shelfy yeah. scarf as well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's also uh, Thorsten mm. Thorsten Stoutmead, who is another star player, and as you might have guessed by the <laughs> sculpt and the way that it's been posed. He can throw barrels at opponents. Um, so you can knock down people from range rather than have to go up and block them uh, and smash them to the ground. So you can clear the way for your Valkyries before they go to score the touchdown, which is pretty cool. 
It's got a big old beard going on and a big old gut as well, as you might nice. imagine. Uh, and then finishing things off, there is the uh, sleek and deadly Ivar Eriksson, who is your classic star player. He comes with a whole bunch of uh, um, stats built into him and abilities and things, so that he pretty much fulfills the role of I'm just good at everything, mm-hmm. which is quite cool. Um, just, I'm just sure techno the- Viking. Yeah, he's just a yeah. techno-viking. He's li- quite literally the techno-viking, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's his walkout music when he comes from the comes out of the dugout. That's, uh, yep. that's what happens here. Um, all of the rules for the Norse are going to be included in the new Spike magazine, uh, which will be available physically and digitally, so you'll be able to get everything in there. It also comes with specific rules for playing on... Um, different pitch types and things because one of the other things that comes as part of the release is the new Norse pitch which you see there and as you can see in the center in that in on the right hand side uh, of the of the pitch anyway there's the uh, cracked ice and stuff so there's the chance that your players might be running to you know get that all important touchdown and then fall through the ice and freeze to death you that mean kind of- you're telling me that there's now a home for the cute more penguins to go and play yes there is <laughs> there Probably, is yeah. yeah exactly yeah yeah <laughs> it was designed specifically for you free <laughs> Uh, there's also a set of dice and the Norse team cards that you can use to kind of just effectively play pickup games kind of with. So that comes with all the stats built on them for sort of like basic players. So you can just sit down and play with that set rather than having to worry about sort of campaigns and, and leagues and that kind of stuff as well. Um, something else I'm going to say. Oh, yes. I really like the dugouts for these. I like yeah. that they've added really cool sort of um, details and things like you've got the funeral boat for the guys that have been badly wounded or yes. died which I think is really cool um, so I can imagine a, a the apothecary dragging the Norse player down the steps and being like oh you don't look very well and they've got I'm not dead <laughs> and and they say fire. he's on fire it's not an NBA jam exactly yeah. <laughs> makes a lot of sense yeah. so there's some awesome stuff there for people who are playing Blood Bowl I know it's uh, a very popular sort of specialist game at the moment as well. A lot of people playing it in Bugmans and that kind of thing at Warhammer World and around uh, the country as well, which is quite nice. So it's good to see Blood Bowl still going strong. Very much so indeed. Yeah. I think that wraps us up for another week's worth of news. Yeah. We're going to take a quick switch and when we come back, not 3D printing. An old friend has returned. <laughs> Yes, Jerry, my man. This is as close as we're going to get to a Warren tabletop gaming blue movie, man. <laughs> I've got a double bill for you today. So, P Work uh, uh, War Games, we have two mats. I have this on my phone because the internet is down in the entire place. So, hopefully, you'll even get to see this episode. But I want to take you through both of these. So, we have Warland, which is this beautiful orangey colored one and then we have ice planet so let me quickly read down the specs of them so warland is available you can get it in the pvc and vinyl you can also get it in the neoprene which this is or you can get it as cloth and uh, i've been coming around to the cloth mats uh, as of recently primarily because you can stick stuff underneath it get nice undulations uh, and the likes. Um, But from the point of view of um, wear and it always looking flat, um, neoprene is still my material of choice, I've got to say. Size-wise, as with a lot of the mats from P-Work, you can get both of these mats in sizes from the smaller Kill Team versions um, up to this one here, um, which is the 6x4. Right. That's the specs out of the way. Let's let's get a look at the mats. So let's have a look at Warland first. What a riot of color this is. Right, so, man, dear. (laughs) It's, it's, It's another perfect choice. If you want, look. I like having mats that are a canvas, so the mat itself doesn't have too much narrative in it that would tie it to any one particular game or any one particular genre. And then you can hit it with whatever terrain, uh, little uh, scatter pieces and everything else that you want 
to really just uh, set the game tone that you're after. So this one is one of those um, kind of all-purpose mats that are useful to have in a collection and will work right across most of the genres. Um, Napoleonics fighting on Mars? It could be a thing. <laughs> Let's get a look at some of the detail of it. Um, look, the colors are vibrant. Um, there's a beautiful array of the colors. You know, when I walked into this room and saw this one on top, the room just popped. You know, it's uh, so even from uh, the perspective of the wow factor, um, whenever somebody would walk into the space that you're gaming in, it just whoo, resonates. Let's have a look at the the, the detailed print. Way. The print is lovely and sharp. There's a nice use of the darker shades and lighter shades to give a sense of depth uh, to the mat. The mat itself has lots of interesting features. So it has these kind of more, I don't know, flat, sandy, almost like um, worn away uh, areas into your kind of more rocky uh, areas. And then here we've got a lovely crackled earth uh, kind of pattern. So, um, you know, I'm immediately thinking, do you know what I'm thinking, John? I'm thinking Mechanicus, right? Check out these. Imagine a couple of these bad boys marching their way across this mat for death and destruction. How cool would that be? Just oh, pew, pew, pew. Love my pewdie pews. So, um, yeah, the Mechanicus kind of stuff, I think, would work well in that. But hey, if you're playing Stargrave um, or any of the fantasy games, you know, I can totally see this being a kind of your pits of hell kind of thing with your like abyssal dwarves piling out over this. So yeah, it's a beautiful mat. I love it. Love the vibrancy of this one. So if you haven't completed your generic collection yet, stick that one on your list. Definitely worth it. Right, let's have a look at the next one. So now, this one is Ice Planet. Again, right? You would be surprised how flexible something like this is. Um, and I'm going, to, I'm going to rise to the challenge. Sci-fi, come on. It'll work for any science fiction game. I can't think, like, is there any science fi sci-fi that only takes place in Ibiza during the summer in raves? No, I don't think there are. I think that they have a wide variety. This will work for it. Fantasy games? Come on, man. This is your cracked, uh, cracked earth kind of thing. You know, any of the fantasy games um, will work on this. Historical? Yes. I have a historical one in mind for you, John. Can you guess what it is? Historical Napoleonics. There is a wonderful story of uh, war. It, basically, it was the, the first and I believe only successful cavalry charge on a navy. <laughs> So what happened was, um, this navy was attacking. I can't remember who it was. I think it might have been the, the Netherlands or the Belgians or something like that there. But anyway, this navy were, were attacking them. And they'd pulled into this, this port, John, this harbor. And they were pummeling them with their cannons and stuff like that, getting ready for an invasion. But then the cold weather hit and the navy got frozen in. And the, the port area completely froze over and they were defeated by a cavalry charge over the ice into the Navy. What about that? So if you want to play your Napoleonics, oh, John, here we go, right? Imagine these guys, right? Check them out. So imagine this, so this is our, what did we call these guys again? Personian. The Personian Guard, yeah? So imagine those guys, smashing across. I'm looking desperately for a boat. Where is the boats in here, guys? Uh, oh, 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 John, that's a nice one. Right, let's check this out. So imagine the Personians going 
and attacking this bad boy here, if I can get this bad boy out. We all live on an orc submarine. So a frozen in situ orc submarine <laughs> with your person. Check that out. Come on. That's awesome. That is just all shades of awesome right there. Right. <sighs> Enough of the playtime. You can tell I've missed this so much. <laughs> Let's have a look at the details. Look, it would pass for frozen ground or uh, actual frozen ice, in my opinion. There's nothing in this that I think would um, interfere in your narrative. So if you wanted this as a kind of like a glacier, um, I think that would be absolutely fine. I think it would work beautifully as a glacier. Equally, those darker blue spots certainly, to me, um, give it the opportunity to be a frozen, an actual frozen lake um, or something like that. And, you know, it's... Guys, th these are the, this is the kind of mat where you get to really play um, with, the, with tweaking the rules uh, and whatever. So I have some rules for you, John, okay? Obviously... This can't move. It is no stationary uh, vehicle, okay? It can't move. The cavalry, every move they make, they have to finish it with a D3 roll, um, of, uh, maybe with some kind of a scatter mechanic, of them slipping and sliding around the ice. Okay? So, um, you know, they move their six inches and then D3 to see um, what they, how they slip. Now the, the scatter mechanic, here's a tip for you. So the scatter mechanic is not about changing their direction because their momentum will always be in that direction. The scatter mechanic changes their facing, okay? So you roll the scatter dice, they've moved their six inches and then they've slipped and they're facing as the horse or whatever uh, tries, to, tries to find its, its little hoofs on the, on the ice. This is where having these kinds of mats, because how many times do we just meet up and you only let the, the actual terrain itself uh, involve in the rules? Oh, you know, it's blocking line of sight, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, 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 we've all been there. But this mat gives you an opportunity to fundamentally change the physics, the underlying physics of the game, and introducing something that you wouldn't normally see outside of a naval game, where you would have wind features causing ships to continue with momentum. You know, you would see that in some of the naval games, some of the sci-fi um, battleship kind of games. Heck, we can bring it into our 28 mil little men's games um, using something like this. So, yeah, oh man. Really, really liking these. I'm now desperate, actually, to get a game in. So, yeah, back to the studio, guys. Ice Planet, Warland from P Work War Games. Okay, so there we have it. Uh, a pair of delightful battle bats. Mm -hmm. um, if you're interested, the P Works website have got the pair of them in a variety of flavors, sizes. Um, and material, to, yeah. Uh, yeah, to Ooh. suit anyone's uh, particular collection. So if you need it to be very wipe cleanable, then you can get it in PVC, or you can have the delightful neoprene ones that Warren was um, grinding Loving against. Himself Handling. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, quite nice maps. If I'd realized that one had been in the studio about two days earlier, there would have been some Stargrave games being played out across that because that, <laughs> that is almost perfect for the basing item. Like a mining world. Uh, yeah, well. yeah, 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 it's 100% yeah. is exactly what yeah. I was looking for. I found, you know, found it a very nice map anyway, but I'm just kind of annoyed that that was, that was <laughs> heading away from me. It's because Warren always likes to break the mats in himself. That's there true. We have it. Yeah. Yeah. So there you go. Very War nice. World and Ice Planet. <laughs> Delicious. Delightful. Ooh. But now we're on to the final part of the show. And we're going to be rounding it off, as always, with a couple of Kickstarters. And we are back to Kickstarter this week. Uh, so the first one is uh, from a gentleman I spoke to recently from Raybox Games, uh, Marco. And this is his Paths Unknown, or the first of the Paths Unknown sort of choose your own adventure style adventure game in a book, uh, which is Escape from Stalingrad Z. Uh, so if you haven't seen this uh i think you're just not paying attention to me and that's appalling and i feel sad 
but there is a, an interview with Marco and myself where we talk about this uh, that's on the website already. I'll link that down below for everybody as well to go and have a look at. So. You're too generous to them. I would just make them use Google. <laughs> John can include the, how do you Google that? <laughs> right here. Let me Google that for you. Uh, but the idea behind it is uh, they are narrative pulp historic games. Right. Uh, so the first one, you wake up in Stalingrad during the Battle of Stalingrad and uh, some of the, the enemy soldiers are shooting, but not shooting in your direction. They're shooting away from you. Um, and essentially, it's the start of a, a zombie. I don't know if it's an apocalypse, but certainly a zombie rising. Um, and at that point, you realize all bets are off. This whole war between nationalities has been sort of uh, pushed to one side because of the war against the undead. Um, you have a variety of heroes um, with various skills and abilities that will be sort of pushing their way from the war-torn zombie-infested city of Stalingrad as they attempt to escape. And along the way, you'll meet other heroes slash classes, adventurers like the sniper um, that have different abilities and skills uh, that will sort of push on the storyline and allow you access to different people so you can play it in, you know, with multiple different ways, with different characters, with different abilities. Um, but there's, there's also sort of a choose your own narrative as well. So depending on how you choose to explore and get past the scenarios may open up certain scenarios for you or miss out them entirely. <laughs> <laughs> it's good, isn't it? Yeah, so I was like, yeah. Uh, this is a really good trailer, by the way. It's oh, yeah. a very good trailer. Nice. I, I also appreciate the fact that Marco hasn't got it jumping around like madman, uh, giving me motion sickness and annoying <laughs> my happiness. Um, so as you can see there, there are both standees and miniatures. Um, there's even little top-down country things. Nice. Uh, but the, if you just want the sort of the, the minimum game, um, you can play this out quite happily just using the standees and the tokens. If you're more into your miniatures and you fancy doing a bit of painting, then you can pick up the models as well um, to replace the counters. But everything is self-contained within the footprint of that book when it's opened. So on one side, that. you will have the narrative story, the scenario set up, um, what you're playing through, what you need to find, what your objectives are. And then the right-hand page is the maps. So it's a very quick game to set up. It's very uh, low impact. Uh, for filling your tabletop. I know some games can be sprawling affairs that take hours just to set up and, and play week, through. Yeah. <laughs> but the, yeah. the nice thing about this is it's it's just a case of flip it open the book, play the game, and then pop it back on the shelf when you're done. That's um, awesome, yeah. Yeah, which I'm 100% I'm behind. Yeah. Th yeah. This is going to be hopefully the, well, I say hopefully, it's well-funded, so this will be the first of... Um, of several using the Paths Unknown system set in around World War Two. We talked in the um, the interview about some of his plans for future games as well. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's really nice to see the idea of a essentially a, a choose your own adventure narrative board game um, that you can sort of play through. That that you can go ahead and grab a, a PDF of the rules with some scenarios. He dropped those out last year for people who followed him on Facebook because I've got them sitting somewhere. Um, so you can see how the game plays. But it's it's a, an interesting little, just a, a tidy little package, shall we say, that you can play out these sort of pulp adventures. Uh, and there's so much room for expansion and exploration within World War II and pulp in general before you even start going off book and doing other things. Uh, mm. In the past, Ray Box has done um, fantasy and sci-fi and, and sort of Space Hulk-like homage, Steel Legions or Legions of Steel. I can't remember which way around that is. Uh, but I'm 100% on board with this. People may say my pledge is there. I'm getting that. <laughs> That's mine. You can't take that away from me. No, have your name um, in the description there. Uh, yeah, 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 I, yeah, I pop up all over the place. You can't get rid of me. Just, just phone yeah. out to you up there and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, also, a nice thing about this is it's not just stretch goals based on cash money. Um, there are a lot of social media ones trying to promote the game and spread nice. it around. So, so it's a good way. It's not just about chucking money at the wall. It's about getting a, a community up there. And um, the, there are two Facebook groups there, one specifically for Stalingrad Z, but then there's also just the, the Paths Unknown um, Facebook group where there's sort of discussions about where things are going to go next. Uh, and it's a, a lovely little game. 
an yeah. interesting concept behind it as well. The thing that I liked about this is that these are the kind of games that, as, as you say, could be just sprawling, tile-based, yeah. miniature-heavy affairs. But I like that Raybox have pared this down to be like, no, 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 we'll play this on a, in a book. Mm. It can be set that, up yeah. in a couple of seconds, and you just play what's on the page. I think that's yeah. a really cool idea. The other thing that's nice about it is that it, like you were saying, you're saying that it's kind of quite quite easy to play through these. Mm. I think they mentioned it's between 20 and 40 minutes for yeah. a scenario, which I think is just amazing for a, an evening's worth of gaming. I think that's really good. Yeah. Or yeah. to fit in during a lunch break or something. Yeah, you can you can yeah. push on several sort of parts of your story, uh, yeah, depending yeah. on how things are going, or uh, you could replay if you've completely fluffed your lines, you know, haven't got <laughs> through this. If you haven't got yeah. through the scenario and you just want to go back, and mm -hmm. try it again or try and try and do it correctly. Yeah. Not um, like wasting yeah. three hours or something. Yeah, because you don't yeah. want it, if you if you're replaying a scenario, you don't want to have to spend half an hour resetting it up and then another two hours playing it. If mm. if you're only playing through for twenty minutes, um, then you can go on that way. I quite like the two point five sort of D that Warren likes, although I must say, if I had a choice, if I wasn't using the miniatures, and I am, I would prob I'd like the top down tokens that he has there rather than the yeah, standees. Yeah. Mm. I just really like that top down look. It's just me. Um, Makes it a little bit easier to see things, I think. Actually, yeah. when you're looking down at it. Yeah, yeah. but in most cases, I imagine people would be sitting sitting down around a table playing this anyway, so yeah. it's it's not particularly um, egregious. For know, such a for such a big game as well, it doesn't take up much space because of the ball yeah. because of the ball being in the book. Uh, that's mm -hmm. what I find with uh, the likes of stuff labels or sleeping gods that do the similar thing with the book. It doesn't take up much space, and as you said, yeah. just put it away real quick. And as you can see there, um, solo or co-op mode. There is a cap on the co-op. I want to say it's three people for co-op. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But also, hundred-page scenario book. Obviously, fifty of those are the scenario, and fifty of those are the maps. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, but yeah. that's that's a wow. fair. It's a fairly good start. Chunky. You know, for people who are just getting into this, um, I know whenever I was talking to Marco, we were talking about the book size as well, just being able to have like a shelf full of these books. And I was talking to him about the, because it's map based, is that going to be limiting? Because every map is going to be kind of the same size. Um, but then that's where the, the scenarios come in to sort of their fullest where you, because you are restricted it makes you think more about how the game actually plays out rather than just go well i can just add another tile however we've seen these spiral bound books in various sizes and, and the printer that he's using could do them in multiple sizes so if this works there may be expansions in the future that work off bigger books so you can have your larger you know tank factory or double page spread or the whatever big escape from standing <laughs> <Bradley>. yeah <laughs> whatever i mean the, the next one um i can't remember the name of it there was a German base that was built into a mountain. Oh, it's just okay. a honeycomb network of tunnels. Um, and, and is it all going to be weird, be weird World War theme then? For so now, the, is it? Or? The initial, the initial ones are going to be weird World War. Um, where it goes after that, like I say, the the paths unknown uh, is the system that's the engine that's going to be running it all. Uh, and I, I think there's a lot of scope. There's really you can go nuts with it. You could do anything you want. You know, nineteen twenties. Do do more of the Cthulhu esque stuff, or go full fantasy? Yeah, or go I hard, say, I'd love to pick up a fantasy version of this. Yeah. yeah. Well, if it's in a book format, you just get a couple of like books and extend it if you want outside <laughs> of it. Just make yeah. it bigger yourself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> go, go nuts, go all over the show there, um, as is your want in life. But uh, but yeah, Escape from Stalingrad, like I say, well funded, super well funded, and there are seventeen days left on it. Um, so I'm hoping for more unlocks before it goes away completely. Uh, and then it'll be fascinating to see where it goes from there. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. So that's that's my first little dip into Kickstarter. <laughs> Can you tell Jerry's been busy? <laughs> yeah. My second one, and weirdly, it, in some respects, very similar to the end of the week. Right. Um, <clears throat> so Chronopia. I can't remember if you've talked about this whenever we're talking about Prince August in the past. I don't think we did because I no. think we are focused primarily on Warzone. So Prince August had the molds. Prince August had the molds because they bought them when Heartbreaker Miniatures went under, which is the system that um, that or the the 
miniature company, the, the hobby manufacturer that I've done the, the, producer, the stuff from yeah, Impact yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. are now doing. They're not doing the Cronopia range, and the Cronopia disappeared off Prince August's website uh, a couple of years ago, just during the pandemic, without sort of much of an aplomb. It's just like, boom, gone. And the reason it's gone is because a new company had picked up the license and they're resurrecting Cronopia now. Mm. 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 <laughs> we, I, I think very briefly in the past, we talked about um, when we were looking at sort of free league and stuff, there's a, a an old Swedish RPG called like Drakar Ok. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. Damon, yeah. I think Dragons yeah. and Demons, something like that. The original Cronopia is a miniature spin-off of that RPG. Oh, and then okay. it kind of went from there. Mm -hmm. So if people are unaware of Cronopia, and I think probably a lot of people are going to be unaware of Cronopia, um, it's a dark fantasy. <laughs> Jesus, it's dark. It's, it's not a great place to be. Uh, <laughs> the, world, the world kind of went, you kind of go in cycles. You had this guy who had foreseen uh the rise of darkness and it was going to be terrible and he started uh, he was a bit of a magician he started playing about with stuff to essentially make himself immortal became the one king he carved out a massive empire called the firstborn which is humanity there's a repulsor knight doing the lord's own work keep it <laughs> up boy and um uh, and he conquered you know a big chunk of the world went right grand you know, he's sitting on his throne and uh and the other races, so the the Black Blood Empire, uh, which are sort of your orcs, ogres, and, and goblins, uh, the elves and the dwarves formed what they called the Triad, uh, because they were not at home to being sub subjugated by the humans. Right. And they pulled the empire down, killed the one king, and enslaved humanity. Uh, and that went on for several centuries, um, until eventually the, the other races fell apart. Uh, went back to their own sort of things and left humanity alone. And then four prophets sort of appeared who started proclaiming that the one king was going to return. They helped rebirth the one king who uses sort of chronomantic powers to do mess with time. Uh, who was, who's, who's more or less immortal. So if you think of him as a demigod, he, said he uh -huh. reformed the firstborn, conquered a new kingdom and founded Cronopia as the capital. Right. However, it now appears that in trying to put the world together to prevent the rise of darkness he may have actually set into motion what would happen to bring the rise of darkness his prophets decided hey if we've got an immortal demigod sitting on a throne he doesn't need us so they all turned to darkness and uh, and founded the devout so it's a skirmish game where you've got your usual sort of factions Mm -hmm. Not a massive, massive amount of factions, you know, humans, uh, the devout who are the ones following the prophet who sort of use undead and demonic um, creatures in equal amounts, uh, the black bloods um, who are uh, a sort of a, a very Persian-esque orc faction, uh, the elves who are like elves and everything, actually, to be fair, they are fairly standard. They're all arrogant, bitter people. Uh, <laughs> and then the dwarves who spend most of their time underground. Um, mm -hmm. And you can play out skirmishes from sort of five miniatures, which is an almost RPG-like skirmish game. Right. Where, you, know, you really drill down into uh, the mechanics and tactics up to mass battle. So there's like three levels you can play through Cronopia. Um, the models themselves are being redone. And I quite like this. I really like the art style. Let's just start off with that. Paolo Parente mm. did the original artwork for some oh, of the covers, right, yeah. and Adrian Smith did so much of the internal I was going to say, a lot of that looked Adrian Smith. That's yeah. what I was going to <laughs> Lots, lots and lots of Adrian Smith yeah. artwork, which blew me away. Well, he's amazing. So. Um, and the miniatures, I still have a chunk of my firstborn. The miniatures are nice, big uh, Kev, uh, Kev White sculpts, but they're, uh -huh. they're big, chunky, fairly flat, sign of the times. Um, they are getting new sculpts which means if you don't own any Cronopia, then there's a whole new range of you stuff can. coming in resin. Um, if you do, they can still use the old stuff. It will be slightly smaller. And the nice thing they've done here is actually do a scale comparison between them. They have, yeah. Oh, yeah. that's great. So I think they're doing it with CO cast, aren't they? So if you've seen our videos on that, then... They've said it's a resin. I hadn't seen 
which one? Yeah, I think it is the repulsor knight. He looks badass. Oh. <laughs> yeah, the repulsors were always great. I've still got my iron guard, but I didn't have a. They didn't do a horn blower, or at least I didn't have one. I have the standard, which was broken. I need to fix it. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> this isn't about what I own. There we go. There's a miniature <laughs> game. So it should be about what I own, but it's not. So they were big for back in the day this was mid 90s it, it um it went through a couple of companies and sort of stopped in about 2005 i think it ended up in america at one point um and then went to a computer game company so they held the license for a while which is why sort of nobody was doing anything with it mm -hmm. but there is so much history lore and backstory behind it and like a 200 page rule book close to Two thirds was history and backstory and lore of the factions. Um, there are factions that aren't in this. This is just starting off with the sort of the initial dwarf, elf, human, devout, and black blood. So the, the sort of the five core forces. There's a couple of others after that um, that they have plans for because they have a lot of plans for this game. Um, one of which is it will be going to retail, and they're planning on monthly releases um to supplement it but also it's a new era as people may be aware this is no longer 1995 Jeez, <laughs> but, it but it means things like social media exists so they are planning on doing a lot more i was going to say audience participation is possibly the best way to do it but games and people's decisions will help shape the world so nice. what awesome. you do with your friend will help expand the story and there's quite a lot of story there already yeah. um as you can see there's quite a lot from the the elves are you know terrible magical gets um but there are different <laughs> there are different clans within <laughs> the various realms um so you, you know you've got ice elves and and that sort of thing um, and I think they said if they have plans for the first supplement, we'll be moving into the north. Um, they did do some supplements that change stuff up. I've still got my Sons of Kronos here, which adds uh, sort of a, a Celtic barbarian force to the what is normally very heavily armoured uh, firstborn armies. Um, and they are just a, a, an unusual style what they've tried to do is keep the original style as much as possible, but then mm -hmm. make make the miniatures that aren't practically two dimensional. Um, and if I go to there, boop, here's some of the early 3D print renders. Oh, nice! So you can see there wow. the madness we're talking about here. Quality is great. I love that. I also appreciate. Uh, the firstborn had so many check patterns on everything, every tabard, every cloak, all was checked, all had to be hand painted on. The fact that they've just sculpted them on for Sculpted people these days. That's uh, nice. Yeah. yeah, it's it makes life so much better. I haven't seen any black sisters yet, which is really annoying. But my black sister, although I still have the black sister model, so I'm okay. I don't know if the rules are going to be in there, <laughs> but time will tell. Yeah. You are uh, safe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for people who do, already or have already played chronopia uh it is using the same system um but with some tweaks the um the game can even be played in the solo mode um which is going to be interesting so um marchin was saying it works kind of like diablo you pick one of your guys to be like a hero and then there's an ai for your opponent and they just throw tides of endless minions at you that you butcher your way through until you get out the other side nice. and then have to fight one of the larger bosses um which i think will be a lot of fun because when you see one of the factions they haven't shown yet or one of the parts of the faction there's the swamp goblins so it's part of the black blood empire but specifically in the swamps and you've got little armored goblins mounted on things like hornets and dragonflies flying around his calf uh, it's it's just so great the black blood empire as you can see there, one of the ogres, so four-limbed, or six-limbed rather, four-armed. Um, the, they have a very Persian feel, but the orcs, goblins, and ogres don't fall into the normal savage barbarian stereotype. They yeah. are a very... Um, oh, the size. They're a very regimented system of, of government. They're, they are not noble savages. They're, they're perfectly valid race. In their own right they've got a very obvious persian theme the ogres are in charge but their orcs are their diplomats and alchemists 
Oh, okay. Uh, and right. you know, if, if people need, if you need to send a, a, a diplomat from the Black Bug Empire to go and talk to some uh, Lotus Elves to make sure that they get off your land, then you send some orcs to talk, mm -hmm. not orcs to tear their ears off and throw the heads back at their friends. You know, <laughs> although they will also do that. Um, so yeah, I'm just I'm very excited uh, to see what else goes. The orc reminded me a little bit of the aesthetic. If you remember a range that was out called Norsegard hmm. from years and years ago, that kind of, that look with sort of big shoulder pads, yeah, all that kind of thing. Big shoulder pads was very much the the feature of Chronopia. Everybody well, had big uh, shoulder pads of, of the eighties. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. The 90s, there's, there's a devout. <laughs> oh, that's on great! Horrendous. Wow. Never got anywhere near any of those. No. I've got a chariot to run him over those that'll teach him. But yeah, I'm, I'm, well, you know, it's true, I do. Um, but I'm, yeah, I'm fascinated to see where they go. As you can see, you've got the, the likes of the trolls and the ogres and your orc leaders and archers who all have this very Persian, Eastern, or Near Eastern theme to them. But the fact that they're not just cockney white boys who are going to rip your head off. <laughs> yeah, I like that. I like the fact that it's a terrible world that's getting worse, yeah. and, uh, and nothing you can do will make it any better. Um, and I'm just really, I'm really happy to see somebody delving back into Cronopia because there's just so much to see. There's so Oof. much story there that they could play around with um, and explore. And obviously, these days you have those little curly toes. It's cool. Um, <laughs> these days you have so much access to things like i mean when target games were producing this chances are most people didn't have a, a, a local game store that they could pick this up in and you know if you didn't pick up one of the two or three uh, they did their own magazine actually um but if you if you didn't have access to that you probably wouldn't even know that warzone and Chronicle I mean, and is, Chronicles yeah. existed so <laughs> you know you're dwarven manx skull champion mm. so you can pick up um, any of the factions or there's a little two-player starter set. Yeah. And, and like I say, you can play this from five, seven minis for the basic intro, mm -hmm. or they're talking about a mass battle game that will take, you know, like your whole afternoon with a couple hundred miniatures aside. Uh, and then the middle one is kind of the closest to the original Cronopia, where it's sort of 30 to 40 models aside kind of thing. I think, I think they break it down as, because there's like a hero-y, skirmishy, battle royale style thing. There's patrol that's like, 15 to 20, army, which is 40, and then grand army, which is 50. But then yeah. obviously there'll be more stuff beyond that. But, mm. uh, but I think that's a really, I think that's nice because I think more and more people are moving towards just having to paint a handful of models. Yeah. Especially for a newer game system as well. Well, a returning game system. But, uh, yeah, it's, I, said, I wasn't expecting to see Chronopia back on the tabletop well, in a meaningful yeah. way. <laughs> oh, um, no. Uh, also, the Cry of the Damn Metal song. Which is the theme for it? It's amazing. <laughs> I really like it. I'm 100 on board with that. Uh, but if you are interested in seeing what it's like, um, you can. Uh, I think it's Cronopia World. I want to say um, there are the first and second edition PDFs on on that website where nice. you can have a look. And it's the system is not dissimilar. Uh, it's been tidied up a bit, but if, uh, if you've played yeah. it before, you'll know it anyway. Um, and then some things that are brought in. So in Sons of Kronos, they split the stat line for cavalry, um, where it was just one stat line rider mount. They, they then decided to split it. And so, so things like that, that as books came out and they evolved the system have sort of been incorporated back into this, into the rule book. So uh, it works like that. That's what I'm getting. I'm having all of that. <laughs> all of this me 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 so you only know you do small count of miniatures but you're getting them all yeah but you know that's across five factions a at the moment I've yeah, I was gonna say, yeah. a small amount of miniatures right. for every faction yeah you're but quick. i want every faction yeah, yeah. so yeah. you're right and, yeah and you can you I mean you can you can get right in there and pick up whatever you need that starts it's a nice little bundle well, so. yeah 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 Sorry, I'm not. I'm getting this one. Well, I'm not getting this one because it was early access with an STL file. I don't care. There we go. There we are. That. Ah, that please. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I digress. So yeah, Cronopia. Um, everything old is new again. That's what they tell me. I'm back round. <laughs> Class. I'm gonna break out my black sister. Uh, my uh, firstborn chariot. Oh, firstborn chariot. It's a four horse chariot. I put a repulsor knight on the back of it. Smash face. I wonder if chariots are in the core rules. 
Time will tell. If you're after that, <laughs> you can back it. And there's 15 days left. Not quite funded yet, but it's not for my lack of trying. Um, so, yeah. Oh, plenty of time. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's they have big plans for it if this doesn't go through i'd be very surprised and if it does uh, it looks like it's, it's going a to be hair well of funding yeah, so it's, 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 yeah, yes. it'll be well supported for the foreseeable future um because the guys mm. behind it uh marchin and illis have big big plans so yeah i think that wraps us up for another week mm, yeah i'm gonna go and look at my chronopia stuff <laughs> <laughs> Um, if you fancy joining us on Sunday, it's Easter. You can get sick building a uh, IKEA flat chocolate bunny egg, um, which is a thing and is quite disturbing. Uh, all you have to do is pop across to on tabletop.com. And if you're not already a member of the Cult of Games, then you can join us for a 30 day free trial. Uh, don't forget, if you want to win that prize of Wingspan uh, from the UK Games Expo and Great board game. Yeah, yeah. pop a comment below. Uh, tell us who your favourite bird is. And uh, we shall be back again next hey. Friday. <laughs> Until then, have a great week of gaming. Bye-bye. Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now. And while you're at it, why not hit subscribe and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on. <laughs>